to take your seat now so we can make a start. Thank you. I bring you greetings in Jesus' name. My name is Amos Fatukun, and by God's grace, I'm going to be chairing this service uh, for today. We have come to God's presence. You know, at times, we could think that this is just routine, what we do normally every week, week in, week out. But there is nothing like routine when it comes to God's presence. Every encounter with the Lord is unique, is special. And I want us to be expectant as we are in God's presence. Today, we are so delighted to welcome Hian, uh, Hian Deleuze, which I believe, uh, I, I think is very well known to most of us in Bethany. I was talking with him earlier, and he told me that he had been with the MCYC camp for 50 years. That's well before people like me were born. So welcome here, and thank you very much. And we believe that the Lord is going to bless us through you. And welcome to, uh, to all of you, too, who are regular uh, members here. And to those people who are watching from different parts of the world, we extend the greetings of Jesus Christ to you. And we believe that you are going to be blessed this morning. In the presence of God, there is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We are going to pray. Our prayer is potent, super potent. That is the means by which we talk to God. And the scripture tells us that whatsoever we ask in the place of prayers and we believe, we will receive the answers to those prayers. And there is no problem that is too difficult for God. The Bible says, is the Lord with whom nothing is impossible. And so we will pray together. As we pray, I will ask us in the first 30 seconds or one minute just to reflect in the place of prayer. And if the Lord brings something to your heart to, to say it to him, feel free to do so. He's your father. He's your dad. Uh, just know that he's there with you. Uh, shall we bow down our heads in prayer? Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We adore your most holy name. We bless you because there is no one like you. Thank you because you have brought us here for a specific purpose. Before we got here, you were here. We thank you because you are the Lord who knows all things and can do all things. Even the grace that we have got to wake up in the morning, the grace that we have got to go to work, the grace that we have got to do all those things that we do, we don't take them for granted. We thank you, Father, for this Sunday morning. And thank you for you have brought us into your presence. We ask you that you be glorified in everything that we do this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Uh, there is nothing we can do except by you. And therefore, we pray that you take over completely. Those of us that you have privileged to be speaking this morning, we pray that we're going to speak in the full knowledge of your Holy Spirit empowering us. And we pray, Father, for every heart that listens to you this morning, that every heart will be blessed, transformed, changed, encouraged, empowered. Lord, we pray that through your word, we're going to receive answers to some of the naughty things of life. We pray that through your word, there will be salvation. Through your word, there will be healing, there will be deliverance. And we pray, Lord, that at the end of the day, all glory shall be yours. We realize that there are a number of our people who are going through challenging situations relating to health, relating to their finances, relating to their, their families, whatsoever the challenges are. We pray, Father, Lord, for your intervention. We pray that you intervene in our nation too. Our nation is going through a turbulent time. You are the almighty God who can bring solutions. And we pray that you give our politicians the knowledge, the wisdom that they need to tackle the different problems that this country is going through. 
We remember people in far and distant parts of the world who are almost constantly subjected to deprivations, some of them wars. We pray, oh God, that you are going to bring your intervention upon them too. Even people, Christians who are in places where they are so severely persecuted, we pray for the joy of the Spirit, the comfort of the Spirit. We pray for the strengthening of the Spirit to be their portion. And we ask, O oh God, that your name shall be glorified in all the nations again. We pray that souls will hear the gospel of the kingdom and they will come in. The Bible says that the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, even as the waters cover the sea. We pray that so shall it be. We pray for all missionaries, everyone who is speaking the word of God in one form or the other, today and for other days that, Lord, you are going to empower them to speak the word of life, and everyone who hears will receive that life. Lord, bless us abundantly today, and at the end of everything, may all glory be yours. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. So, we're going to invite uh, the music team to lead us in two songs, Before the Throne and then King of Kings. Wonderful hymn, this, and wonderful words before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, perfectly great high priest whose name is love whoever leaves them is for me his name is greater on my heart my name is written on his heart I know the world is in his no more can bid me then depart no can bid me then depart Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the fear within of what I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is Perfect, spotless, righteousness, great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. With himself he cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood, my life is clean with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and
your suffering you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus Christ. Praise forever to the King of Kings. And if you looked carefully through the, the lyrics of that song, words like redemption, words like darkness, light, and we want to today contrast darkness and light. So you're going to be hearing a lot about light because the message is about us being the children of the light. And I want you to uh, look up there. It says Jesus Christ as the light. So what we are being asked to do is to reflect the light of the source of light. That is Jesus Christ himself being the light. And we are imitators of himself. So Jesus Christ himself declares, and I've put there a number of scriptures. The, the first one to your left hand side says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but we have the light of life. And all these scriptures there are from uh, John or uh, either the gospel or the epistle of John. So Jesus Christ himself declares that he is the light. Not one of the lights, but the light. And the Bible says, the middle one, that that was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Think about that. Another version says is the true light that gives light to everyone who comes into the world. It means that there is no other source of light apart from him. And if anyone is not going to stay in darkness, he must receive that light from the only true light. Jesus Christ. And then the last one to the right hand side says in 1 John 1 7, and this is relating back to us. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So our walking in the light tells of the fellowship that we have with one another. So because we are children of the light, we must relate with one another in the light. Openness, truth, love, care. So that is how 
we imitate him who is the light and who has given us the light. So today, we're going to be hearing a lot uh, from him about how we can truly uh, answer to that, being God's children and children of the light. And the scripture is Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 8 to verse 16, which we're going to read later. Now, this video that we're going to watch, now, this is not from the usual one that we bring, but it's uh, nonetheless as powerful. And it is going to be answering this question, what the light does. If you think of the light, look at the light here. So let's imagine there was no light. There was no light even coming from outside. So automatically, we're going to be in darkness. So the presence of darkness presupposes the absence of light. But when light comes, light overcomes darkness. So they are mutually exclusive. So here we see that uh, kids video, which is actually for all of us, because I know adults themselves like uh, those videos, is going to be answering the question, what the light does. Hey kids, today we're finishing up our series, Get Rich. We've been learning how being a Christian makes us rich. With money, right? No, with God's love. Today we're talking about God's light. Memory verse. For you were once full of darkness, but now you have light in the Lord. What's so special about light? And what does that verse mean anyway? Light helps us see. Have you ever tried to find a toy in the dark? Oh! Or go to the bathroom without the lights on? It's hard, isn't it? Light is good because it helps us see things. Without light, we get hurt or lost. But with the lights on, we can find our way. You see, Paul is writing our memories to a bunch of pretty bad people. They did things that God didn't like, but when they met Jesus, everything changed. God turned the lights on, and then they saw the way they were supposed to go. But there's something else you should know about light. Light makes things grow. Do you know how plants work? They start with some dirt, a seed, and water. Simple. But nothing will happen without light. It's the energy source for plants. Without light, there's no root or branch or fruit. And it's the same way with us. God is our light, and without him, we can't grow fruit. You know, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. We can produce that stuff because God shines his light on us. But there's one more thing about light. Light shines out everywhere. Think about what happens in a totally dark room. It just takes a teeny little light to wake up the night. Think about that. Dark is everywhere, from wall to wall and even up to the ceiling. But turn on the light and it spreads everywhere. That's the kind of light you have as a Christian, even if you're a little small. The light of Jesus is in you, and that's really big. So do you have the light of Jesus? Will you turn it on? Do you, have, do you have the light of Jesus Christ and will you turn it on? So light helps us to see, light helps things to grow, and light shines everywhere. I'm going to bring you a couple of uh, notices. I've got quite a number, so please uh, bear with me. So today we're having our communion within the service towards the end, which means that we're not going to be having any communion this evening. So if you go on to the link, you're just going to be there by yourself. Well, the Lord is there with you, so you can enjoy his presence. But just know that the others are not going to be joined anytime soon. So these are the, the programs that we have got. And towards the time of Christmas, you realize that uh, we tend to have a number of uh, additional programs which are not only meant for us, but also meant for the people outside. Because the role of the church is actually to bring in uh, the people outside so that they can be part of the fold of Christ. So this is another opportunity 
God is giving us to do that. Today, the one that you can see in yellow, that's what we are doing, Children of the Light. And next week, we're going to be, be starting the Christmas programs. Yay. So I'm believing that you're looking forward to that. And in December, we have a lineup of those events. So the first Sunday is going to be the real Christmas, which is going to be led by Alan Garner, supported by the youth and the kids. And afterwards, uh, we have the guest service. On the 18th of uh, December, we have got two events, one in the morning and one in the evening. The morning one is our usual family service, and then in the evening by 6.30 p.m., we have got the, the carols by candlelight. And there is a Christmas Day service if you are not already planning towards that. Now, in terms of the, the weekly uh, services, we are going to be having one tomorrow. That's the, the prayer and ministry. And it's been great. We have been looking at First Thessalonians. And now we are in First Thessalonians chapter 4. And that is going to be led by Peter McGrath. So you're welcome. Tomorrow it starts 7.45 p.m. And the time of prayer will be from 8.30. And also the, the Thursday friendship group meeting. I know that a couple of Sundays ago, they said it didn't have a name. But now it does have a name. It is called the Thursday friendship group meeting. And I'm actually going to read out what Mal sent so that you can see how quite important and exciting that event is. So for Thursday, this week at 10 a.m., Rob Jeffs is speaking, and we give everyone a warm welcome. These are not my words. Those are Mal's words. We give everyone a warm welcome as we start with coffee and biscuits and a table quiz. Rob will speak, and we have a short prayer time. Our library and communal jigsaw puzzle are also there to enjoy. We can guarantee a great time. Isn't it, Mal? Okay. So, please, don't miss out if you are able to, to make that. This has been announced before, just to remind you of uh, the Wura Food Bank, uh, if you want to contribute to that. And this also has been announced before, and that's the, the program that is taking place on the 28th of uh, November at 7.30, and the guest speaker is David Dean from Barnabas Fund. It is about persecution, a word that maybe people don't like to hear, but a word that is a reality for the church if we walk according to God's words. And then the next one is about the dates for the MCYC camps next year. The one that comes again here is so important because all of us have to be part of this, and that's the Bethany bus. It's been made, it's here, and they have got bundles of the uh, material in the foyer there. But we have got to pick them and distribute them this week. The reason being that there is one of the flyers inside the bus that is going to be announcing a program that is starting from next Sunday. So our Christmas our programs, they start next Sunday. So the people have to know by this week if we expect them to come on Sunday. So please make sure that uh, you go there, check the, the ones that you are able to distribute, and just note it down that you have picked that. So that is so, so important. Please don't uh, forget that. I think that's about all I've got in the way of uh, announcements. And the next thing now is to turn to God's word. The children can leave now. Sorry, I forgot to <laughs> announce that. My apologies to you. <laughs> 
we are going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 8 to 16. And if you have your pew Bible, you can open to page 1176. Page 1176, Ephesians chapter 5. I'll wait a bit for people to get there. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And that's the end of that reading. It's loaded. I believe that the Lord is going to help us to understand it as the message comes. Now we will have the music team to lead us in Lord, I Need You, and afterwards, Hian is going to come to share God's word.
Good morning. Good morning. I always enjoy coming here because I see so many faces from the past. So many people I've shared fellowship with over many years. It's great to be with you. A couple of weeks ago, I managed to break my glasses. And um, I had to go in and get a new pair of glasses. And the young lady who was there fitting the frame of my new glasses, these glasses, on my face, uh, we were talking and I explained to her that, you know, because I was buying them in Stockton Heath in the village in which I live and work, or I did work, I said to her, well, I've, I've worked in this place, you know, uh, a long time. I said, I can go back even before the three-day week. <laughs> and she said... What's a three-day week? <laughs> so I had to explain that back in 1973, something happened that affected the whole country in that uh, the uh, miners went on strike and because the energy was uh, sourced from coal in those days and there wasn't enough uh, reserves at the power stations, then the Prime Minister, Edward Heath at the time, had to declare three-day week, which meant that electricity was going to be cut for three days each week, alternately in the beginning of the week or later in the week. During that period, there was no power, no energy, no lights. So we had to manage with candles. Believe it or not, this might come as a surprise to some of you who are younger. We managed with candles. It was a different world. In those days, these days, when you've got your, um, your credit card, you just swipe it across the machine and it picks it up. In those days, they had a contraption where there was a slide and it was a, a triple copy of carbon, which you had to post off to the Barclay card. It was different in those days. But you know, for three days, we were without power, and without light. But we managed. Three days, we had to cope. But life, light, is essential. As we've already heard, it helps us to function. It helps in the productivity of plants. And it enables us to see. And it puts things in perspective and helps to keep us safe. And we take it for granted. It enables me at this moment to see you. If it was darkness now, and the only power we had was electricity, I would be able to see you. Unfortunately for you, you can see me, which is not quite as such a nice experience. But you know, the Bible is full of references to light right from Genesis through to Revelation. The reference in Revelation, in, tw in chapter 22 and verse 5, it says, there will be no more light. They will not need the light of a lamp or a light of the sun, for the Lord God will be, with, will be their light. But it's the references in Genesis that I find particularly interesting as it draws us in and introduces us to this subject of light. Right at the very beginning in, in the first chapter of Genesis and verse 3 it says the Lord is speaking for the very first time and he's issuing a command and he says let there be light and there was light. Without that we won't be able to see all the rest of creation. 
There had to be light first to enable everything else to take place. Genesis 1 and the very following verse, in verse 4 it says, and God saw that the light was good. It had to be good because it came from God. It was right and it was bright and it was from Him and it was wonderful. For the very first time, instead of being darkness, there was light. And light re requires power. Without it, there's no light. In the very following verse, it says, He called the light day. He called the light day and He called the darkness light. Genesis 1.18 says, He separated light from darkness and God saw that it was good. So there we have the very basis of the subject that we're considering today. The creation of God. The very first thing he did was to create light and separate darkness from light. The difference between light and darkness is stark. If we were here this evening and we walked into this room and it was absolutely dark, as we've already said, it only needs a match or a flame or a candle and you have light. And immediately, as you increase the light, the darkness is dispersed. You can see things. You can put things in perspective. And that's exactly what God wants us to do this morning. But what we're talking about here, springing from natural light, is spiritual light. If we've already laid down a few principles in regard to natural light, it also applies to spiritual light. Because spiritual light comes from God, just as natural light comes from God. One brings about the other. Natural light is just an illustration of what God can do spiritually in our lives. It can dramatically change our lives because the light of God can shine in us and upon us. The contrast here in the spiritual realm is also stark between darkness and light. Light will always overcome darkness, and spiritually that applies as well. The light of God will overcome the darkness of this world created by Satan. And here we have in this passage two situations, one past and one present, one past tense and one present tense. And Paul is speaking to Christians, <clears throat> those people whose light, lives have been transformed through the light of God shining in them, upon them, and changing them. Once he says, <coughs> you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Once you were in darkness. I was taught when I went to Bible school so long ago to always look at Scripture in its context. See what is actually said, why it was said, when it was said, where it was said. And we're talking about Ephesus. I had the opportunity a few years ago to visit Ephesus. Walking down the street there is an interesting place because it showed exactly what the life was have been like when Paul was there. And the guide said as we walked down the street, you'll notice on one side this is where we had the library. And down underneath there would be a tunnel. And on the other side there was a place of ill repute. It was a model. It was like so many ports. It was a place where people congregated in darkness. You were once in darkness, Paul says. In John 3 and verse 19 it says, Men love darkness rather than light. Until you experience the love of God in your life, you are 
in darkness. The amazing thing is that people don't believe they're in darkness. They actually believe that what they've got is, is great and things are going to work out somehow. And somehow we're going to make our way through life. And somehow we're going to end up in a kind of situation when this life is over where we just disappear. We, nothing happens then, but we don't get too worried about it. So they're in a state of spiritual darkness without realizing the option that is available, the option that is possible of moving from a period, from a, a situation where people are, in a way, stumbling around trying to find answers and making it up as they go along as to what happens when they pass from this world to a point where the light of God shines into their lives, transforms their lives, gives them certainty and hope and a future. It says in John 12 and verse 35, the man who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. And that is so true. Unfortunately, you know, our society is not all that dissimilar from the society in Ephesus. Because we, as well as the people then, dismiss anything to do with the light. We're living in a society which is spiritually dark. And the only way out is through the light that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What kind of a promise is that? From the one who always keeps promises. That our lives will be transformed, transformed from walking and stumbling around, trying to find our own way, trying to find our own answers to a situation where we are having and receiving and experiencing the life, light of life. But that, Paul says, is where you were, he says to these Christians. That was your experience then. But you've moved from that. You've moved from that into another experience where the light of God is shining through you. And it says, in the light, the Lord is the very source of the power and the light that you need. You've moved from one extreme to another. Now you are light, it says, in the Lord. The key to it is the last three words. Because it says, in the Lord, He is the source and center of your life. The power source that provides the light. Without Him, that power source is not switched on. It's not available until you realize that through what happened at Calvary, when He suffered in darkness to enable you and me to receive light, He had to enter into the darkness. And springing from that experience, we receive what God has offered and given to us. Now, we return to the center, really, of what it is that we've been asked to speak on this morning. Because in verse 8, it says there, For you were once darkness, but now you are light. So, if those of us who are Christians are experiencing that light, what does it actually mean day by day? as we face the challenges of life. He says, I want you to live as children. He does not say, I want you to live as men and women. 
He says, I want you to live as children, not as people of the light. Why did Paul say that? Children are people who depend on others. You know that if you've been a parent. Children depend on you. You have a responsibility for ensuring their safety, their security. It's your responsibility to see them move from the point where they're born to see them develop through those early years. And we have that same dependence upon our, from our Heavenly Father. As children of the light, we don't try and attempt to work things out because children are unable to do that. They have to rely on someone else. And we have to rely totally, not on our own strength, but on Him. Children get things wrong. You know that as if you've been a parent. They think they're getting it right, but they have a tantrum and uh, they start throwing things and they shout and scream. They get things wrong. And I stand before you this morning as a person who gets things wrong. I'm sure you have the same experience. I'm sure you feel sometimes, well, oh, I just wish I hadn't said that or done that or I don't seem to be experiencing the presence of the Lord in the way I should. But it's dependence on Him. And saying, Lord, forgive me when I get it wrong. Forgive me when it doesn't work out. Forgive me when I'm trying to think things out and do things my own way. Instead of relying completely upon you. Children need the right food to grow. 1 Peter 2.2 2 talks about spiritual food. And that's why we have the Word of God. And if we are going to be children of the light, we have to recognize that through this book, through the Scriptures, we can have the teaching that's going to keep us walking in the light. Preventing us from falling. Enabling us to see, giving us direction and purpose. It's there, available to us. But lastly, after these warnings, there is one aspect of being a child that is wonderful. Because children have got tremendous potential. And so have we. The Lord can work in our lives, enlighten our lives in a way that possibly we've never dreamt of. He can do things through you and me that are impossible, humanly speaking. He can give our lives purpose and direction and aim, everything we need. Because He has designed us for a purpose, and that is to bring Him glory. You and I, with all our failings, with all our faults, with all our shortcomings. He sees the potential as we see the potential in a child. Maybe that's why Paul describes this particular aspect of his teaching as being the children of light. But in verse 9, it appears to be a mixed me metaphor, but it isn't, because he goes on to say that the result of this will be goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, none of those things are possible, humanly speaking. They are attributes that can only be fulfilled through the Lord. We are flawed and we fail. But his aim and intention 
is to develop us from being children and to be those who are mature enough to show forth goodness, righteousness, and truth. But then he goes on in verse 10, and he says, and find out what pleases the Lord. Interesting phrase, isn't it? Find out what pleases the Lord. I wonder if that's our desire. The Holy Spirit is directing our thoughts, our intentions towards Him. Satan is trying to divert us from that. Tell us we're not worth it. Tell us that uh, the, 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 the second rate is, is acceptable spiritually. But really, we know in our heart of hearts, despite all the shortcomings we have, there is something in us that causes us as Christians to want to, to please the Lord. And you know and I know that when that happens, we have joy in our hearts. We feel somehow it's right because we're fitting in with His plans. We're united with Him. His light is within us. And all the list here of all the things that shouldn't happen really come under the title, don't do the things that don't please Him. And that's easier said than done, isn't it? So we have to continually come back and not allow ourselves to somehow go into the shadows. We have to maintain our spiritual life in the light. But when we get into the shadows and when we do get it wrong, He promises to forgive us, to bring us back. Without His power, we cannot achieve anything. So He says... Find out what pleases him and don't do the things that don't please him. And don't say the things that don't please him. In conclusion, we have something here which seems to stand out. It's in verse 14 because it says, that is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. How does that fit in? But it's interesting because it is said that this was one of the songs or hymns of the early church. That's what they would sing. And in conclusion, it brings the whole thing neatly together. Wake up, O oh sleeper. When did you wake up this morning? You woke up when the darkness was fading and the light was coming in. You were no longer in the night, but in the day. No longer in the darkness, but in the light. And you woke up. And that's what the Lord wants us to do, whether we're Christians or non-Christians. He wants us to wake up to what is possible. He wants us to wake up to what can be achieved, not through us, but through Him. Wake up, He says, O oh sleeper. The day's come. This is your opportunity to live. Rise, He says, from the dead. Move from the time where you're spiritually dead to where you are spiritually alive. Move from darkness into light. Experience the transformation that can take place. And finally, he says, and Christ will shine on you. Isn't that wonderful? What a great promise. Those early Christians really got it right, didn't they? 
if this is what they were singing at that time, Christ will shine on you. And Christ will shine on you. He will shine on me. He will take us from a place of darkness into a place of light. He will take us from being children into those who are maturing in the Christian experience. And one day, we will be with him. And the light of heaven will shine upon, upon us as we experience his presence. So Jesus, the light, inviting us all to be lights and inviting the entire mankind to come to that light in salvation. But for as many people as have believed him, he wants them to continually be light and to increasingly shine brighter and brighter. Thank you very much. God bless you, Ian. And if anybody wants to make a decision based on this, whether you're watching us uh, online or you're here at uh, present, you can do that. Jesus saves. And so if you have never made that decision, do it now. Come and taste that the Lord is good. If you want to speak with the elders, they are here after the service, you can speak to them. If you are watching online, there are contact details, how you can reach the church, and we'll be glad to speak with you to to write back to you or email back. And that is the eternal gospel of Jesus. It saves to the uttermost. Before we close, we want to do another very, very important thing that the Lord commands. And that is the Holy Communion. And he says that until he returns, we must continue to do that. It's very, very solemn. It's exclusively for those who know the Lord. And even for those who know the Lord, the scripture encourages us to search our hearts to be sure that we are in the right situation before we eat the communion. If you have not got any of this, they are at the back there. You can request for that. And that scripture that we often read when we are doing Holy Communion which is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 24. It talks about Jesus Christ giving thanks, breaking bread, and giving it to his disciples to eat. And it tells them what that bread actually symbolizes, his body. And what at the time he was giving them instruction was going to be done to his body before he went to the cross, he predicted everything, that his body was going to be broken only because he wanted to save mankind. His body was broken, but remember, three days he lay in the grave, but on the third day, he rose again, and he is in the glorious form of his body now, but it tells us that as believers, the same experience of rising from the dead, that scripture, we even read it. Jesus says, rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. And one day, all those who believe in him, those who are <coughs> sleeping now or dead, they will rise again. And those who are still alive will be caught up with him. It's a privilege to share with the Lord. And I want you to believe that as we do that together, I believe strongly that there is no time you take the Holy Communion and something doesn't change in your life, in your body, soul, and spirit. It is impossible. We're talking of Jesus Christ. And so this symbolizes the body of Jesus. And the wine symbolizes the blood that he generously spilled on our behalf, the blood of his cross the blood of his covenant by which we are sealed. And that is why those who are in Jesus are covered by that blood. And there is no power of the enemy that can break through the protection that the power of the blood of Jesus confers on you. 
Let us not allow the enemy to deceive us into thinking, well, we are powerless. There's nothing we can do. No, the devil is not supposed to treat us anyhow. We're God's special children. The blood of his cross cleanses us from all sins. And we overcame the enemy by, through his blood and the words of our testimony. And so, what I'm saying is, as we take this, let us know that something great is happening. If there is an unconfessed sin, let us tell the Lord to forgive us before we take the bread. Verse 25, after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had sobbed, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And before we share it together, I want to remind you of the experience of two disciples after Jesus Christ resurrected. They were going to a city, I mean, a village called Emmaus. And they were discussing all the events that had happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus joined himself to them. And he was asking, oh, what is it that has been taking place? And they, they retorted. They said, so, are you a stranger? You don't know anything about everything that has been going on for the last few days. You didn't hear of one Jesus Christ who we believe was going to save us, but who was killed by our leaders. And they gave him a rundown. They didn't know it was the Lord because the scripture says that he held them from being able to identify him. And towards the evening, when they got there, it was like departing from them. And they said, come. And they said, abide with us. First, that's where that song was taken from, I believe. Abide with me, in fast falls the even tide. And the Bible says when they came into the house, he broke bread and gave it to them. And immediately their eyes were opened. And that is what Jesus Christ does. He opens the eyes of the blind, the spiritually blind, the physically blind. I believe that it's opening our eyes today. is giving us fresh light as we share the communion together. So if you could open the upper flap, you'll be able to access the, the bread. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we share this bread with him. Shall we take the bread now? And also, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we take the cup in Jesus' name? I will pray to just thank the Lord for all that he has done for us. But please don't forget the, the Bethany bus when we are leaving. They're there waiting for us. Father, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you because you have taught us today. You have touched us. We thank you for the grace that you have released upon us to be able to shine more as lights. Thank you for the grace to share the communion and we believe that something has changed within us just by the sharing of that communion. Lord, we thank you because as we go out this week, it shall be a blessed week, a glorious week, a week of opportunities, a week when we hear from you clearly what we are supposed to do, a week when we depend on you absolutely, and we live our lives to show your glory. We give you all the glory for everything that you have done in this service. And may all those blessings remain with us. And may we ever be grateful to you. Thank you, almighty God. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our service is over. Go and have a wonderful week. Full of God's joy. Full of God's grace. Don't be afraid. You are a child. God bless you.